Hi, and welcome back to Leslie's Lab. In this episode, we're going to take a look again at oscilloscopes, but we're not going to look at benchtop oscilloscopes like we have done previously. We're going to take a look at ultra portable oscilloscopes like this Tektronix 222A and this GC Miniscope from 1947. So let's stick both of these on the bench and take a look. So this is the Tektronix 222A a miniature oscilloscope that I picked up off eBay a couple of years ago now. I think I paid over the odds for this but I really really wanted it because as you can see it's a very very tiny oscilloscope. Um, it's got 10 megahertz bandwidth so you know it's perfectly usable for audio work and um, other you know sort of low frequency stuff. Um, so we'll power the thing on and take a look. We've got this absolutely gorgeous miniature display. It's got little vector graphics for the um, for channel one and channel two, and our trigger and our time uh, time base down at the bottom there. Uh, there's a little icon in the top right hand corner that says it's charging at the moment. This is like a, a, a rechargeable scope. Originally, these had uh, lead acid batteries in, uh, but I've replaced these with um, nickel metal hydrides. Um, so it's really, really, really nice scope. Um, absolutely fantastic. Uh, recently this developed a fault where the display would start um, like fudging up and, and twisting, it would start rotating. Uh, and after I opened this thing up, and these, these are a pig to open up, I should have done a teardown video on it really. Um, I, I'm not in any hurry to pull this back apart to do that though, they're a, they're a pig to open up, uh, they're a pig to get back together. But it turned out there were dry joints, quite a few dry joints on the main uh, power supply board. Um, one of the dry joints was next to uh, the pot for rotating the trace, so it was a pretty easy fix. Uh, but really, really nice. There's a number of features on this as well. We can store waveforms on here. Um, so we could go to save, and I could save channel 1's waveform. Uh, so that's it, saved now. And if I want to recall it, I can recall it. And if I move, uh, assuming for recall it, if I move my uh, current waveform out of the way, now we can see we've got uh, three traces on the scope. So the bottom two are my live traces and the one at the top there is the recalled waveform. So really, really nice uh, miniature scope, like fully featured. Uh, some of the bits and pieces on here, we can go into display mode um, and we can get XY. It's not uh, particularly pretty, but there's, there's our XY lissa juice uh, pattern there. Uh, we'll just hit clear, come back out of there. Turn it back off again. Uh, what else was there? Oh, there's auxiliary functions. There's a self-cal function, which will self-calibrate the scope. There's a config function for the, um, the internal modem. Uh, not modem, it's got uh, RS-232 serial, so you can like hook it up to a PC and, and talk, to, uh, talk to the PC with it. Uh, we've got a little align function there, so that when you come to um, align the scope, you can uh, line up the little uh, test pattern there with the graticule. Um, really, really nice. Uh, I'll just move this to one side and unzip the uh, bag and disconnect my probes. And I can show you the battery modification that I did on this. Um, it's a dead straightforward one. I've seen a few on, on YouTube already. I think Mr. Carlson's lab did a really, really good one um, where they modified uh, nickel metal hydrides. But basically I've got a, a battery pack um, and just put nickel metal hydride cells in it. Um, had to buy a connector to fit the uh, little connector down there, but other than that, straightforward. I put a fuse in just for a good measure, and if I disconnect the uh, power there, we've still got a nice running portable scope. And I think I can get maybe 45 minutes, perhaps even an hour out of this thing. The scope will power off uh, automatically by itself when, it's, when it realizes it's on battery power uh, to conserve batteries, but yeah, pretty uh, decent little scope, it has to be said. I think, like I say, even though I paid over the odds for this, I think uh, well worth the money to have uh, something so portable, to be honest. Um, it's very, very nice indeed. This is another little eBay find. Uh, this is, in fact, um, a vintage miniature oscilloscope. Um, I've still got the original case for this. Um, so we've got the scope itself. Uh, we've got the mains lead and the, uh, the little probe lead up the top there. Um, I've actually bought this as a, a, a refurbishment job. I uh, haven't got around to doing it yet, but this thing actually still works. These were produced in about 1947, and it's the GEC Miniscope. So we'll just lift the thing out of its case, and we'll set this to one side and we'll take a look. So this is it, a really, really 
nice miniature um, oscilloscope from just after World War II. Um, absolutely fantastic little piece of kit. Uh, in a moment I'll power it up but you know check out the size of this thing. I mean this is this is absolutely minuscule for um, just after the war there. There's a couple of uh, connects on the back. There's a connector down here for uh, mains uh, so we can feed it 240 volts. Uh, this um, at the back was for a vibrator unit so that you could actually run this off of uh, batteries. Uh, unfortunately uh, this thing when it came off eBay didn't have that. Uh, we've got a number of connections on the back here, um, so we've got like time base out, um, sync out and so on. And there's various uh, like add-ons and stuff you could get for this. You can actually get a second, um, uh, second CRT unit that would fit on the top there, so you'd essentially have a dual beam oscilloscope. Um, so pretty cool. So I'll go and get the mains lead and we'll power this thing up. This, this actually, I haven't touched it yet in terms of replacing components. It's full of ancient electrolytics that are like 70 odd years old. Um, but the thing actually powers up. Uh, so let's fire it up just now. So this is the, the GC Miniscope fired up. If I put my hand over the screen there so that, uh, so that we can get the light off the screen, we can just about see uh, this scope's best approximation of a one kilohertz square wave. Uh, like I said, not one single component has been replaced in this unit and everything in here is, is well over 70 years old. Um, so all of the electrolytics that are in there will have been dried up. Um, there's plenty of um, um, other capacitors as well that are, uh, probably want replacing. Um, I suspect that some of your carbon composite resistors will want replacing as well. So, you know, it's kind of displaying a square wave, so we're all good. So we, we know that the time base is working, we know that the amplifiers are working, and we know that the CRT and the transformer are working, so everything else will probably get gutted at some point. Um, the, the controls are a little bit uh, a little bit dirty and a little bit how you're doing. Uh, but yeah, it's not it's not terrible. I mean some of the some of the switch positions um, leave something to be desired as well, so they all probably want cleaned. Um, but it's not, it's not terrifyingly bad. It's certainly retrievable, um, I would say at this point. See, these pots are noisy as well. Uh, the brilliance is quite uh, low as well. I mean, it's it's not it's not a super bright CRT. Uh, and again, I suspect that if capacitors are dried up, it's probably dragging down the HT as well. Um, but yeah, really, really nice, cool little unit. Awesome. Um, I'll maybe pop the cover off of this. Let's let's take a look inside this unit. So I've got the cover off, but before we take a look inside this thing, I've also got the instruction manual and some other bits and pieces. Uh, the, the bandwidth of this oscilloscope is like 300 kilohertz, so I don't suppose um, in the modern era this is very much good for anything, but it'll make a, an entertaining restoration project. Uh, so here's the manual. Um, let's see, is there a date in here? I'm pretty sure these were like 1947, um, but yeah, it's good. We've got a little diagram so we can see um, where all the various components are. So we've got like three valves in here, our CRT, absolutely jam-packed full of, um, of electrolytics there. So that's going to be uh, quite a lot of work to uh, pull all these things out and replace them. Um, so this is gonna be um, a rainy week project. Pages are stuck together there, so I'll have to do something about that without tearing it. Um, yeah, so it goes through all the controls, um, how to use it for servicing. We've got another um, photograph there with uh, the wiring diagram for the transformer and the, uh, again, capacitors are three valve bases, uh, plenty of carbon composite resistors in it. Um, yeah, it's kind of a oh, full, full circuit diagram as well. I'm kind of hoping uh, that somewhere in here there'll be all the values for these and the, and the, the various voltages, uh, how to remove and replace the CRT. Um, explanation of everything. Oh, we've got everything in here. So we've got how many volts uh, on the AHT. Um, we've got sensitivity, uh, sweet frequency ranges. Look at that, 60 kilohertz max. Awesome. Uh, more circuit diagrams of the, the CIT section. And operating instructions as well. So a really, really nice piece of uh, history for sure. Uh, definitely worth restoring. So there's, there's other bits, of, you know, you could get accessories with these things as well. We've got an IF alignment unit. Uh, somewhere in here, I'm pretty sure it mentions the, oops, the double beam unit as well. It's an explanation of how cathode ray oscilloscopes work. Um, fascinating uh, little book for sure. 
uh, pretty cool. Um, so yeah, it'd be, it'd be kind of nice to restore this to its former glory. I mean, we can see on here that the traces that you get out of this thing, um, even in fully working condition, aren't like the best uh, oscilloscope traces you can ever get. Um, but yeah, pretty, pretty cool. Let's see what the rest of the paperwork says. Oh, this is about uh, running just general instructions for servicing and stuff. It would have been nice to see an actual date on here as well. Um, anyway, let's let's take a look inside the unit itself. So I've popped the case off. It was kind of a struggle to get this off because um, of corrosion. Um, so we'll take a look at this side first. We can see our uh, transformer. Actually, when I plug this in, there's quite a significant amount of hum from the transformer. My suspicion is, um, as I said, that many of the uh, caps in this are probably dragging down HT rails and stuff. So it's probably under quite a, a significant load when it's powered up. Uh, I've got a bit of wax, uh, it looks like wax paper, uh, covering up the connections at the back, but we can see all the point-to-point -point wiring between the valve sockets there. Um, every single one of these will be carbon composite resistors and they'll want checked as well to make sure they're within uh, tolerance. This structure along the top, uh, I was surprised to see it when I just opened it up. My suspicion is, I don't know, I'll have to check the manual, but my suspicion is this is a metal rectifier, uh, probably the HT rectifier. Uh, and there's a couple more uh, visible down the bottom there. Um, so it looks like those are our metal rectifiers. So these will be um, discs of selenium uh, and copper, no doubt, in there. Uh, so we'll flip it over and take a look on the other side. So we can see our three uh, cans which contain our valves. Um, again, I'm not super keen on taking these out just now. I don't want to disturb too much, but uh, there it is. Um, so these, are, these, are pro these look like they're probably all original. Uh, and again, uh, we've got many, many of these uh, wet capacitors with bulging rubber ends on, so every single one of these will probably need pulled out and replaced um, at some point. You know, I'll get the uh, voltage ratings and the values from the manual, um, and then we'll start picking through these um, and replacing every one. And probably find, if I use modern replacements as well, that we end up with a hell of a lot more space in here as well. Uh, but as you can see, everything's very, uh, very tight. Uh, there's more, more capacitors at the front. I suspect these are probably mostly for uh, time base and such. Um, and these are more likely to be power, but once again, I'll have to get the manual for that. Um, it's looking a bit uh, foosty in there. It's full of mold. Um, so all of that will need um, cleaned off. Um, I don't really want to undo all the lacing. Um, this was an art. It's quite, in quite a lot of vintage equipment you'll find like bundles of wires laced together in this fashion. Um, so I might just clean that up. Uh, there's quite a bit of black in here but I suspect it could be pitch uh, because that was, a, that was a, a technique back in the day for insulating things as well. And then of course we've got the CRT. Um, it's got a metal shield around it. I assume um, it's likely to be mu metal shield, which um, helps prevent, it helps exclude magnetic fields from the um, electrostatic CIT. Um, again, it could do with one hell of a cleanup. I don't know what that is. I have to wash my hands after poking around in this. Um, who knows what uh, what garbage it has in it. But yeah, really, it's really interesting construction. It's very, very, very compact. Um, like I say, it must have been a lot of work for the engineers back in like 1947 to design this thing. Um, but really, really nice, um, has to be said. I think this will clean up very, very well. Um, you know, there's a couple of places on here where there's chipped paint as well on the front, and we'll replace those, probably polish the screws. Um, the Bakelite knobs are actually looking um, fairly reasonable. I don't think I've got to do anything to those. Uh, it would help if I wasn't wiping dirt all over them. Um, yeah, even the gold paint survived um, between the knobs there. So very, very nice. Again, with a little, little care and a little paintbrush, we can clean that right up. Um, as for the rest of it, yeah, that's going to be real entertaining, um, prying all of those out of there. Uh, but I'm sure it's manageable. Some of these look like they're encased in paper. Um, so it's really surprising that this powers on at all after like 70 odd years. So I thought I'd stick these two scopes side by side for a little size comparison here. Uh, we can see that the GC miniscope is much, much narrower uh, than our uh, beloved Tektronics here. Uh, they are just about as deep as each other. Um, so if we were to line them up front and back there, um, they're almost the same length front to back. So, you know, in terms of, in terms of size, they're not far off. Obviously, or maybe not obviously, because you can't see it on camera, but let's, 
the heft is almost the same as well, although the, the, although the Tektronix is mostly plastic, I suppose, with the batteries in, um, you know, the weight is approximately the same. I think the, the GC is, is a little bit heavier. Everything's made out of metal, uh, like it was in the good old days, um, but still um, two very, very nice scopes. Um, out of both of these, obviously, uh, the Tektronix is going to be the one that's likely to be used, you know, put, sort of push, pushed into service. Um, doing audio work or low frequency work and um, this uh, is is really just a curiosity it's just a toy but uh, you know once again I'm going to spend some time refurbishing this I'll maybe do a video on it because um, I haven't found any information anywhere on the net of anybody uh, really really going to town on one of these things and replacing everything in it thanks for watching this episode of Leslie's lab if you want to see more content like this don't forget to hit like and subscribe down below and I'll see you guys next time